Here's our next example. An object dropped from rest falls 100 meters before hitting the ground. How fast was it moving when it hit the ground? An object dropped from rest falls 100 meters before hitting the ground. How fast was it moving when it hit the ground? Please pause the video and give that problem a shot. Uh, the first issue I want to bring up here is I think some people might look at this and say, well, uh, duh, when it hit the ground, it wasn't moving, right? Some people might say, gee, I don't have to do any work. Obviously, when it hit the ground, it stopped moving and its speed was zero. Uh, so some people might say, gee, this is really easy. When it hit the ground, its speed was zero. But that's not really quite what the problem is getting at here. Uh, when you think about it, um, when, you, when you're looking at something like when the object hits the ground, you have to ask yourself, is, the, is this question really asking us about how fast was it going the instant before it hit the ground, or is it asking about how fast it was moving the instant after it hit the ground? Well, obviously, the instant after the object hit the ground, um, it wasn't moving at all because the ground had stopped it. We'll ignore things like bouncing. If, it, if, it, if the object doesn't bounce, if you just think that the ground has stopped it, well then, the instant after you hit the ground, you're not moving at all, uh, and your speed would be zero, but that's kind of so obvious that it's kind of boring and uninteresting. So, the reasonable interpretation here, the reasonable interpretation is that the question is asking us how fast was the object moving the instant before it hit the ground? Because obviously the instant before the object hit the ground it was moving quite quickly and it's not really obvious how quickly it was going. Okay, so we can't just give ourselves the easy way out and um, figure and say well the instant after it hit the ground it wasn't moving at all. What the question is really asking is how fast was this, ob was this object moving the, uh, the instant before it hit the ground? Um, now the other way to see that is to, um, to save yourself, remember that obviously when we're doing this type of problem, we expect to be using our constant acceleration kinematics approach. Um, well, the whole idea behind constant acceleration kinematics um, is that uh, when we're doing projectile motion, the only acceleration that the object feels is the acceleration due to gravity. So this whole approach only applies when gravity is the only force on the object. We should be thinking about the period when gravity is the only force on the object. But obviously, um, after the object has hit the ground, it's, it's feeling a force from the ground, not just from gravity. Um, that tells us again that we shouldn't really be thinking about what happens the instant after the object hits the ground. So let me repeat that again. The whole um, point of our whole projectile motion approach here is that we're just considering um, the object when the only force on it is gravity. We're considering how does the object behave when the only force on it is gravity. Well, the instant before the object hits the ground, the only force in it is still gravity. Um, so we can still apply our normal kinematics approach to that. But the instant after the object hits the ground, it's got another great big force on it, which is the force from the ground. Uh, and then we can't use our normal um, projectile motion approach because all along we've been assuming that the only acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. So this is the other reason why it doesn't make sense for this type of problem to think about the instant after it hits the ground. Um, the instant after it hits the ground is not just feeling gravity, it's also feeling a force from the ground. But all the problems that we're doing, we're trying to do problems where we can assume that the only acceleration is the acceleration from the force of gravity. Okay, so for both of those reasons, um, it doesn't make sense to think about how fast this object is moving the instant after it hits the ground. Obviously, it's not moving at all after it hits the ground. What we should try to figure out is how fast was the object moving the instant before it hit the ground. In general, anytime you have a little confusion about that and you don't know whether you should be looking at, say, the instant before or the instant after, remember you should be looking at the instant when the only force on the object is gravity. If you're using the approach in these videos, you should be trying to find a path where the only force on the object is gravity. So you, um, you should be looking at the instant when the only force on the object is gravity. Well, the instant before this object hit the ground, the only force on it was still gravity. But the instant after this object hit the ground, there was another force from the ground. Well, that tells us that we really are meant to look at the instant before it hits the ground. Um, because before it hit the ground, we could still use our normal kinematics approach for projectile motion and assume the only force was gravity. Um, and again, even though they didn't specifically say so, we're going to ignore air resistance. Now, it's very likely that air resistance might be significant if you're falling for 100 meters. Um, but we're just going to ignore that. Um, uh, unless the problem specifically gives us a reason to pay attention to air resistance, we're going to assume the only force on the object is from gravity. 
hope that as usual you started by drawing the path. Well, we start at one place and then we fall. We know we're going to fall 100 meters. I'd like to put a sign on that, so let's choose a positive direction. If we choose downwards to be our positive direction, then this can be positive 100 meters. Since we're moving down, it makes sense to choose downward as our positive direction. It's usually a good idea to choose the direction of motion as your positive direction. Now, I know that a lot of textbooks and instructors might just always choose up as positive. That has something to be said for it as well. But in these videos, we're usually going to choose the direction of motion as the positive direction. So I encourage you to follow along with that if you're following with the videos. All right, anything else that we can put in the path? We like to put in as much information as we can in the path. Well, they said the object was dropped from rest. So the initial velocity at the initial point was zero. Um, it fell 100 meters. How fast was it moving when it hit the ground? So let's try to build in the question mark for the question. It looks like the question was asking us for the final velocity, the instant before we hit the ground. Now this, has a, uh, this problem has a similar issue to the last problem, which is it does, it's not really going to make sense to include a sign in our answer. If we decide that it was going at um, 13 meters per second, if someone asks you how fast are you going, well that's really asking for the speed, not the velocity. If someone asks you how fast you're going, if someone asks you how fast you're driving, it would be weird to say, how fast am I driving? I'm driving at positive 60 mi miles per hour. That's not what people mean when they say how fast. When they say how fast, they don't want you to indicate the direction, just the speed. So we'll be meticulous and put a dot here. Remember the dot is just a symbol that I've invented to indicate when we're just focusing on the magnitude. If they're asking you for how fast, they just want the speed, not the direction. So we should just give the magnitude and not the sign. So we're going for the magnitude of the final velocity. Let's try to get into the habit of drawing the velocity and acceleration vectors. Well, we know we're moving down, so the, uh, so the velocity is down. And any time you're in free fall, the acceleration due to gravity is down. We've already chosen our positive direction. Now let's write our kinematics variables. And we can automatically say that the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's put a sign in on that. We've chosen down as our positive direction. So this would be positive 9.8 meters per second squared because the acceleration is down. We were dropped from rest, so that's some very important hidden information. Dropped from rest, that means the initial velocity was zero. We fell 100 meters. We've already labeled that as positive 100 meters. And the question is, how fast were we moving? Well, that's referring to the final velocity. But again, just to be meticulous, Let's label this as the sub-question. We're going to try to figure out as a sub-question what the final velocity was, but that's because what the question was really asking us for was the final speed. Well, obviously, if we know the final velocity, we'll be able to use that to find the final speed. So technically, the question was not directly asking for the final velocity, which is the kinematics variable. It's asking for the speed. So this will be our sub-question. All right, now we have three numbers. Remember that when we have three numbers, we're ready to go on to step five and choose a kinematics equation. We need to fit, find the equation that's missing the time. Find the equation that's missing the time. Here's the kinematics equation that's missing the time. Let's plug in. Now, we're not going to plug in for the final velocity because that's what we're trying to figure out. The initial velocity we can plug in is zero. I'll put parentheses in so I can plug in the acceleration. Positive 9.8. At this point, I hope it's become very automatic. Anytime you plug in a signed number, that you start with parentheses, then you plug in the number, and you include the sign. At this point, that should just be um, a normal habit that you have on every problem. And then delta y, again, we need parentheses so we can plug in the signed number, positive 100. The zero term is going to drop out. 
Uh, now we can use our calculator to find 2 times 9.8. On the calculator, 2 times 9.8 is 19.6. After you've plugged in, when you're starting to simplify, you don't need to indicate every single positive sign anymore. So I won't indicate the sign, and we still need to multiply this by 100. I hope you don't need a calculator to multiply 19.6 times 100. So 19.6 times 100 is uh, 1960. But that's not the final velocity, that's the square of the final velocity. Remember to keep writing down each step meticulously so we can see we still have more work. 